Hello everyone, it's another Wednesday and you know what that means, it's another midweek service and we are so glad to be bringing it to you. So wherever you are in the world, whatever it is you are doing before now, we want you to sit back, relax, because God is about to enter into your life in a whole new way. Alright, but before we get into praise and worship though, we want you to do something special for us. Now, nobody goes on the streets anymore knocking from door to door preaching the gospel, but we expect that you're able to do it in a new way, you know, with the culture, by sharing the link to this service to your friends, family, and I mean, you've shared a bunch of things before. Come on, let me guilt trip you here and ask you, when last did you share the word of God? All right, so share this link to a friend, uh, to family members, and to people you don't even like that much, all right? With that said, let's get into the presence of God with some praise and worship, and here to lead us, the Rock Cathedral Gospel Choir. Let's go. Hallelujah. Good evening, church. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us once again. I believe God is here with us tonight, even as he's there with you wherever you are. And as you have tuned in, your life will never remain the same. Can we bow our heads as we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the grace to come into your presence. Thank you, King of Glory. For your word declares that in the presence of God there is fullness of joy and at your right hand there is pleasure forevermore. Thank you, King of glory, because we know that you are here with us. Your angels are here ascending and descending, meeting each and every one of us at the point of our need. Thank you, Father, for us, your people, are also watching tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word that you will speak, that will touch lives, that will heal somebody, that will deliver somebody, that will give clear direction to that brother, to that sister at such a time as this. Thank you, King of Glory, because we know that at the end of the service, to you alone will be all the glory. Have your way, Heavenly Father, and let your name alone be glorified. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Hallelujah to Jesus. It's time for our choir, the LMGC and RCGC, to lead us further in the presence of God. Put your hands together as we welcome them, and God bless you. Praises to you, our strength, we sing, 
who is not confined by time. Before time was, you are. Before space took form, you are. Before our forefathers, Abraham was, you are. Everything has subjection to was, is, and is to come. But you, O oh God, are consistently is. Your word is yea and amen. Your words are undebatable, Lord. Your words are irresistible. They do not contend with anything. And nothing can contend with you. You are eternal in your nature, sovereign in your domain. And when you preside, your word is yea and amen. Everything that you have said finds expression. Even things that do not have ears, they hear you and come to being. Things that do not have knees, they bow down when your pronunciation are made. Uh, we bask in your presence this evening and bow down to your sovereignty because you alone are God by yourself. Uh, you alone are sovereign and you are self-sufficient. You are also self-sufficing. Blessed be your name forever. In the mighty name of Jesus we have prayed and the people of God said a big amen. Blessed be his name forever. I bid you welcome again into the presence of God. And for us to go very expeditiously into the service, please let's welcome LMGC and RCGC as they bring us a special number today. God bless you in Jesus' name. There's just some problems only God can. There's just a moment that just don't make sense. Oh, I've seen it happen time and time again. Oh, there's just some problems only God can fix. Hey. There's just some battles flesh and blood can't win. But there will be some moments that just don't make sense. But I'm still convinced There is just some problems Only God can fix Not by power Not by mind By the Spirit of the living God By the Spirit of the living oh, yo, Spirit oh, of the living God Not my battle Not my battle Not my battle I've 
seen a breakthrough that I can't explain. I cannot explain. I found a healing, healing in my pain. Oh, oh, oh. No, I know it's that man that was from the brain. Oh, oh, oh. I've seen a breakthrough and I will love. The spirit of the living God. The spirit of the spirit of the living God. Inspiring ministration that was. I love RCGC. They always do a good job. Thank you so much. Hey, now it's time for the Word of God. Listen, nothing can change you like the Word of God can change you, and it will change you for the better. All right, let's receive the Metropolitan of all House on the Rock churches, Paul Ade Farising. Help me to turn to your neighbor and say, Great place, great time. There's some questions I want to ask. 
and I hope to answer in the discourse of our discussion today. Are you the one looking for your set time or is it your set time that is looking for you? In addition, are you made for your set time? Or is your set time made for you? I'll say this up front to you. We do not go looking for opportunities. Opportunities come looking for us. Doesn't mean that you shouldn't give out your CV, your curriculum vitae, or your resume as they say in other climes. But what it does mean is that Opportunities are going to come your way in the normal concourse of your daily life and routine, which can be altered by God where he requires some flexibility from you from time to time. And that's why we must always recognize that we are in a state of preparation for the next level. And so because we are always in preparation, it means that when an opportunity comes, we are already ready for the opportunity. So right now, with where you are and what you're going through, you are being prepared. Prepared is an interesting word in the English language. It means pre-before. And pair means cut. So you are being prepared, pre-cut, to fit somewhere that nobody else can fit. And so when you are in preparation, you are in what we call pre-cutting in action. So wherever you are in life, you are exactly where God needs you to be. If you are a believing Christian and understands that your times and seasons are in his hands. It's like my son, when I'm with him where he lives, he'll race out and say, Dad, I can't talk to you this morning. I've got to go catch the bus. Because that bus only shows up once every hour at a certain time. And it cannot leave the bus stop before that time. But it won't get there uh, except a few seconds, at most half a minute or a minute before the time. And when it comes, he's normally there waiting. He's ready. It's more challenging for him if he's getting there at the same time that the bus is getting there. Because he's not assured that he's in ready position to seize the moment. But if he's ready, he's looking for it to come. He's expecting for the bus to come. And the bus has to detour from the lane and come into the bus lane, the bus stop. And as he sees it, if he's got a briefcase and his coffee, he's going to pick it up and get ready to get on the bus. I want you to look at two neighbors and tell them, get ready to get on the bus. God is never late. He may not come when you want him to, but he's always right on time. Hallelujah. Let's talk about favor in the text for a moment or two. And so when you are favored by the Lord, what happens is that there is definitely a series of appointed times in your life. Settle that in your mind before you go home today. That in my life, backwards and certainly forwards, there are a series of appointed times in my life. That's the word time in Ecclesiastes 9.11. It's the Hebrew word et. And it means time as a window of opportunity. Time that regards or concerns a window of opportunity that opens and it closes. And it has recognition for exactly your own identity. Nobody else can walk through your door but you. Just like Lazarus could not come out of the tomb except he was Lazarus. Nobody else could come out of his tomb except him. Hallelujah. And so, that's the first word. If you put that on the screen, that's the word et. The second word is chance. You understand one chance. 
My mother used to tell us, and that word ed, chance, is the word paga in the Hebrew. So when you look at it in your interlinear, it will have a variation because of the tense. So put a bracket there for after chance, put paga. And then after happeneth, I want you to put the word Q-A-R-A-H, kara. Kara means happened. Can I declare to somebody? There's going to be a trigger happening in somebody's life. And right after the trigger happening, it won't be three weeks. There'll be a series of happenings. One lady, her whole life was ruined. She left Israel and went to Moab. And there her husband died. Her sister's, or her friend's husband died, who was her husband's brother-in-law or brother. Her mother-in-law's husband also died. So all the men in the family died out. Can you imagine the tragedy? One sister said, I'm leaving, and kissed and cried and said goodbye. But the other lady said, where you go, I will go. Where you die, I will die. Where you live, I will live. Your home will be my home. Your God shall be my God. She said, don't come with me. I'm going back to Bethlehem where we left because there was no bread in the house of bread. But she insisted, don't curse me by telling me to leave you. Wherever you go, I'm going with you. And when she got back home, she was just a harvesting, gleaning girl. Picking up the droppings of other harvesters. She wasn't a real harvester, she was just a gleaner. And the guy who owned the field was Jesus' great, 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 great granddaddy to be. And Judah and Abraham were his great, 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 great granddaddy and great, 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 great granddaddy. So the Abrahamic blessing was looking for them. And there was something special happening in that Judaic line. And somehow his eye befell her. And he asked, who is that woman? And they gave him her resume. As to how good of character she was, how loyal in enduring. And how much she had done for uh, her mother-in-law, Naomi. He said, drop some extra for her. And to somebody who's had nothing for so long, broken in her life, broken in her emotions, broken in her relationships, broken in her finances, a little extra. Can I declare to you that one of the signs that you are in the middle of a prophetic word is that God is going to hand you a little extra regularly. So that you always have all sufficiency abounding towards you in all grace. So that you're never lacking or needy for anything as you abound in the goodwill and the good work of our King and our Christ. If you don't believe that, please act important. But if this is your word, I want you to be just to say, Pastor, you're talking to me right now. <laughs> because when you are favored, you're going to enter a great space at a great time. Amen. That means... The greatness of your pace or your space has everything to do with what God is about to do in time that he has already settled in heaven. Because friend, there is a governing word over your life. Because Jesus cannot have another mother in the fourth grand other than Ruth. It has to be Ruth for too many reasons. And he cannot have another mother in that generation other than Ruth. You're too important to God's purpose. The role you fit, the space you fit in, nobody else can fit in it. I hope you're listening. I don't know why you're standing. Sit down. We're just talking. And you know, just when you're disappointed and you're about to faint, that's when Ruth sees that she's getting extra gleaning. She goes and tells her mother-in-law, see you. And she schooled her and she said, position yourself. Because she read it as an opportunity. I declare to you, David's. I declare to you, Ruth's. I declare to you, Joshua's. I declare to you, O Israel. You will not lack counselors to give you wisdom to discern your opportunity when your set time comes. If you believe it, shout amen and really mean it. Because the person you might walk by and fail to give them your business card or fail to take their business card might be your opportunity. 
It's not hidden from you, but it's hidden. Otherwise, everybody else would see it. It's hidden for you. It's hidden for you. That means you have to have the eyes of expectation. So that in spite of the camouflage, you will see the opportunity. Everybody has the opportunity of opportunities. Everybody has the mother of opportunities presented to them at some point in time. It happens to all men, but not all men sees it. I don't mean S-E-E-S it, but that would apply to, I mean S-E-I-Z-E. Not all men sees it, but opportunity, coincident with time, set time, happens to all men. That's what the Bible says in our text. It happens to all men. Nobody is excluded, but not all men sees it. All Israel had the same opportunity as David, but only David seized it. There were generals in the army that were bigger, bolder, stronger than David, but none of them seized it. Only David seized it. The word time in the Bible uh, comes to us in the Greek New Covenant or New Canon. It also comes to us in the Hebrew Old Canon. And uh, I'll throw a few words at you, and one of them is the Hebrew word yum, spelled Y-O-M. And yum is the word for time, but it gives time a certain prism, and it teaches us uh, that time is perceived as a period of light in contrast to a preceding period of darkness. So yum is daylight that comes after night time so light coming after darkness and, and this word yum it occurs in quite a few places and i'll show them to you in a moment but what yum means is that if you are in a dark night right now it's not referencing a 24 hour period nor a 12 hour period but it references a season in your life that has come after or will come after a season of darkness so what is darkness darkness is the inability to see your way out see your way over see your way clear see your way through the incident and the trials that you're going through that have darkened your faith as to what God can possibly do in your life. And so you can't see how your dream will come to pass because it's a dark night. However, the meaning of the word yum means that daylight is coming. Can I use this premise to prophesy to somebody? Your darkness isn't going to last forever. Every dawning of a new day is a prophetic announcement to you that you won't be in the dark forever. Darkness has an expiry time on the clock when darkness must go away and light must come. Oh, I don't know who I'm preaching to now. You're going through a dark time, incidented or accidented by a tragedy that happened during COVID, or by a traumatic incident that happened in your family, or by a disease that the doctor reported back to you after you did your blood work with him, or failure in your family, or a romantic relationship gone sour and all your dreams were hinged on that girl or that guy and now it's all fallen down and you can't see your way out you don't have the meal ticket to get to where you're going and the bus don't look like it's coming there's too much traffic so how am I going to get there it doesn't matter what I can see with the eye it matters what I know in my faith there must be a governing word from God over my life that has predetermined me from before I got here and once I know that word I can settle it in my heart for thy word oh God is forever settled in heaven and if it's settled there and it's the first realm of my citizenship sooner or later as long as my feet are touching this ground the word in heaven is going to become my reality here on earth if you don't believe that act cool and say pastor you're getting out of mind now but if this is your word I want you to tell your neighbor the governing word over my life is getting ready to happen any time from now. I can sense in the ticking of my clock that I'm getting closer and closer to my Kairos moment, my set 
time, my appointed time, my due season. I almost fainted with what I went through in the last few tragedies that were so traumatic. They burned down my house. They burned down my business. They burned down my feelings. They burned me down. But I'm still here. I got my mind made up. I have my body ready. My wife is encouraging me. And I feel something every time I hear my preacher preach. Something is getting ready to happen. Watch this space. Watch this space. Watch this space. And so yum is the announcement that daylight is coming. Weeping may endure for a night. But there's daylight coming. Sound of somebody and tell them daylight is coming. But joy cometh in the morning. And I don't have to wait for the joy to come to get my praise on. Joy can meet me on the road. But I'm going to stop praising him before daylight comes. Because certain as tomorrow night, daylight will break somewhere around 6.30 a.m. in Lagos. I'm going to see a new day. I'm going to see a new dawn. I'm going to have a new shout. I'm going to own a new dance. I'm going to have a new happiness because something called Kara is about to happen in my life. If you believe it, shout yeah. No, you didn't shout it like I wanted you to. I want you to shout it with melody. Yeah. Psalm 118 and verse 24. The Bible says, Psalm 118 verse 24, this is the day, young, which the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, go, Go back to verse 23. Go back to verse 22. Look at this. The stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. You've been going through rejection all your life or all of the last three years or one government or another government or this people or that people rejected you. But guess what? You will become the head of the corner. Verse 23. You know it wasn't your common sense that did it for you. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in my eyes. Not mine alone, our eyes. Everybody will acknowledge you could not do this thing by yourself. It was the Lord who did it. Then it crescendos at verse 24. This is the day. That means this is the period of light. Darkness is over. That's what young means. It's time considered as a period of light. Not just a period where you can see where to go. Or that you are in light so you can go. It's now you first see. Then you can go. Because there's light. That's what young means. It's simple. Do you understand? You will see how. Oh, you're not helping me. Some of you don't even have the dream of ever owning your own house. Let alone two houses. But you will soon see how. I'm owning as somebody here. It's not even in your thinking because what you're looking for is rent money. To partner with one of your friends. To jointly squat in somebody, some landlord's house. I said, that's not your portion. You're only passing through. It's not your bus stop. You're just passing through. You will see how. Hallelujah. The day star will arise in your life. The sun of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. The bright shining torchlight of God will shine upon your path and be a lamp to your feet. You will see how. If you don't believe it, act pretty. But if this is your word, shout yes, somebody. The the other word in the Hebrew for time is the one we've talked about already. It's called et. But what is interesting is that yum is the word that precedes keeper. 
Kippur is the day of atonement. So the suggestion is that because of the cross of Calvary, where all our sins, our disqualifications were wiped out of the way, we now can have daylight. We're not groping in the dark, hoping for how to get to where God is sending us to. We have a certain knowledge that we can get there, we will get there, and we can see the way. The word et not only announces a set time for a new day, but it tells us that it is due time. It's due season. Psalm 1, verse 1 to 3. Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in what the principalities and powers are propagating. No. His delight is in the new covenant word. That's a reconciliation. And in his word, he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted. That's right time, right place. By the rivers of water, right time, right place. Hallelujah. Shall bring forth, no, his leaf shall not wither. He will bring forth his fruit when? In his season. That word season is the word et. Due time. Some of you have worried, when will my due time come? Or some of you were not even thinking about due time. You've been faithful. You've been consistent. You fulfill uh, Galatians 6 verse 9. You have not become weary in welding. And even when you were weary, you kept doing. Your due season cannot escape you. My only prayer is that when it comes, you will recognize it. And you will see for the opportunity that it presents. Hallelujah. Can we go on? And so... Um, there's a Greek word called chronos. Let's look at the Greeks now. The Greek word is chronos. And chronos is the ticking of the clock. It's clock time. So chronos is a movement of time. From seconds to minutes, minutes to hours, hours to half days, hours to full days, days to weeks, weeks to months. So you end up in January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, 22, then 23, January, February, March, and all this has minutes, seconds, hours, and days. That's Kronos. But somewhere inside Kronos, there's another word that is exactly the same meaning as the word et in Hebrew. It's the Greek word kairos. So when you hear people talk about a kairos moment, I release that word as a canopy over this entire family. This year is your year of kairos. So the advice for kairos is let us not grow weary in well-doing. For in due season, kairos, we shall reap a harvest if we faint not. I want you to pick that up with me in the... um, King James, no, the Passion Translation of that verse. And don't allow yourself to be weary or disheartened in planting good seeds for the season of reaping the wonderful harvest. He didn't say a wonderful. He said the wonderful harvest. That's the mother of harvest. In other words, something is going to totally change your life. Your level will change that even you will not be able to try to go back to who you were before. Oh, you're not hearing me. I said, the harvest is going to be so mighty that even if you tried your dogged best, you'll never be able to return to who you used to be before. Your person will change. You can't give me three Ferraris, a a private jet, a Rolls Royce Cunningham, and expect me not to walk with a new swagger. If my chest was down and my shoulders were rolled over, friend, and you added seven zeros to my dollar account, you bet that I'm going to change. Oh, you ain't helping me here. If they put you beside, on the bed, with a wedding ring on his finger and on yours, tall, dark, handsome, got it going on in 54 countries, uh, business mogul to the lint, uh, 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 absolutely drop-dead gorgeous, handsome guy, exactly what you could never dream of, and you put him beside you in his great mansion on the Spanish Riviera, and you are now man and wife. You ain't getting up out of the bed the way you used to before. When you call your friend, Tosi, you're not going to say hello to how are you? Hey, Tosin, how you doing? 
So what are you up to today, Tosin? Because you want Tosin to ask you what you are up to. So you can tell her what your view looks like out of your huge picture window. Looking out onto the Mediterranean Sea at four yachts. Your speedboat, your, your ski jet. Oh, you ain't helping me now. Something is about to change your life. Something is about to happen in your life that will change who you are. You don't need a preacher to excite you. Your faith should have you in a level of excitement. Your excitement is your energy to lay hold of your opportunity when it comes. Even though you may feel weary in your body, God has another level of energy to help you seize what belongs to you before somebody else tries to take it. So a great place is not the physicality of the space. It's the fact that God is with you. And a great time is not a calendar date. It may include a calendar date. However, it is that because of Christ's cross on Calvary, the Lord is with you. The Lord is in you. The Lord is above you. The Lord is for you. The Lord is your under guard. The Lord is your rear guard. He's got you covered. The cross is when that transfer was traded. He is the creator in and all around you. You are in a great time as well as you are also in a great space. So my case study is David. In Genesis 49 verse 10, verse 11 and 12, and I read, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the lawgiver from between Judah's feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. This is a prophecy from Jacob to his son Judah, the progenitor of the Judean tribe out of which Christ would come. Binding his fall onto the vine and his ass's coat onto the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. That's the triumphal entry that led him to the cross. Verse 12, his eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white with milk. Verse 10 tells us that the crown, the scepter, will be Judah's. But notice that instead of the scepter going to Judah, or to Judah, instead of the crown going to Judah, it went to Benjamin. Because Judah was not ready. Why was Judah not ready? Judah committed ancestral bastardry with his son's wife. First son and second son married the same woman, can't go into the detail of it, and they had no children. She sets Judah up, and Judah has a child through her. And that child was a bastard. The law of Israel in Deuteronomy says that a bastard cannot associate in the congregation of Israel for 10 generations. How much more become a king? So for 10 generations, Judah was disqualified from presenting a king. Do you get it? But Benjamin, of whom a prophecy also attended, that the king would come out of Benjamin. And so Saul, when Israel wanted a king they could see, they did not want the king Elijah had. The one you cannot see with the eye. The one to the king they could see. And God said he will tax you. He will heavily burden you with taxation. And they said we still want. We want to see our king. So God gave them a king. He did not anoint them on the basis of a sacrifice. Because the oil that went onto Saul's head was not from the horn of a sacrificial animal. It was from a flask. They anointed him and he ran well. He served well for some time. Hallelujah. But he was a placeholder. There's somebody probably holding your place. Don't mistreat him. Don't despise him. Because if he wasn't there, you might never get it. He's holding your place. Oh, you're not helping me. Don't get jealous of man. Don't cut off his head. Because whilst he has the sword, he can cut yours. Stay alive. Don't go after Saul. Saul is there for your benefit. Yes, he may throw javelins at you, but learn how to dock. Learn it. Otherwise, the javelin will take your head off. Are you there? But when the 10th generation comes, all of a sudden, the hand of God is looking throughout all of Judah. Someone is talking to God and saying, please forgive this guy. God says, don't talk to me about him anymore. I have rejected him. 
I have found for myself a king in the house of Jesse. And you must appreciate Jesse because Jesse raised all his eight sons. One died and all of them were kingly. That when the prophetic anointing walked into Jesse's house and they presented the first son. Samuel said, surely this is the Lord's anointed. He reached for his horn, wanted to pour the oil. The oil said, no, I will not flow. This is not the head that I will crown. They passed six more boys in front of Samuel's horn. The oil still refuse to flow. You know why? Because when something belongs to you, no joker can put his head there and take what belongs to you. The governing word is over your life, not his. It may benefit him, but it is over your life. Hallelujah. Nobody can touch it. And they, they didn't even remember David. They had to get to the end of the line before they called on him. Why? Because he was the stone that the builders rejected in that he was from another mother other than their mother hallelujah and they eventually decided oh uh, at the prophet's word we need to go and get him we don't really want to get him but let's go and get him and they sent for David and in comes uh, this guy who had a relationship with God he was authentic he was but a kid but he was killing lions and bears or about to and he walks in with a swagger because you know when God is with you there's a certain cockiness about you there's a certain confidence there's a certain pep in your step there's a certain gate in your wake. There's a certain glint in your eye that makes you look like a man from another world. And when you talk, things move, things happen because God has so identified with you long before you knew it, long before your daddy knew it, long before your progenitor knew it, long before Adam even knew it. He had his hand on you before you were born. You were his before you got here. That's why your parents, had they finished having children, they still had to have another one because you were the chosen one. Am I talking to some Body. And he walks in because the prophet has said, we will not sit down uh, until the king comes. Because in their culture, you don't sit down at the king's table until the king comes and sits first. And he releases a prophetic word over his life. That boy, you are the next king king over Israel. Notice that the anointing for king is not the same as the anointing for next king. That means you are going into preparation. He sat down. He ate the king's portion of the sacrifice animal. And they poured oil on his head. Hallelujah. From the horn of the sacrifice. Glory to God. A picture of what Jesus did for us on the cross. Why we have the anointing as he has it. Can I preach some more? I'm going somewhere. And he has the anointing of the next king on his life. And there's somebody here. In fact, I see many of you. The anointing of the next level uh, and the next level makers uh, is on somebody's head uh, it's on whole rows uh, it's in whole groupings uh, it's in your family uh, and God uh, honored Jesse because he had raised eight kingly boys uh, only one would be the king uh, but you have to give Jesse the credit uh, that he raised kings my job uh, is to raise you up to be your royal highness uh, your royal majesty my job is to make you a crown princess uh, a crown crown king. My job is to let you know that you're part of the royal governing family and prayer, praise prayerly family of the king most high. That means you are not an ordinary man and your kingdom is not of this world. That means they cannot necessarily identify you for what you are by merely looking at you. They must have some understanding. But what they will see is that your works before men, they glorify God. And David came out of that anointing. It blessed him. Because this is a boy who longed for affirmation and acknowledgement from his siblings. His first circle. Yet they never accepted it. He was king to be. It was imminent. But they never accepted it. He goes back to the same janitor's job with a kingly anointing on his head. Test number one. Can you run with a king's anointing in a hopeless job and keep doing good? Keep doing well and not get weary. Can you do it? If you can, you're getting ready for your due season. Can you take a licking and keep on ticking? Can you hear bad news, keep the good attitude? Can you still shout and dance when there's nobody looking and still have a glory praise on when it's just you, God, and your sheep? You understand what I'm saying? But God doesn't leave you to private audiences. He only uses them for your personal sense of confidence in who God has made you to be. You hear what I'm saying? Here's David. 
the anointing is now ready for him to be king. His brothers have gone to the battlefield. None of them respect the anointing that happened in the house. None of them. His dad sends for him. He says, go to the battlefield. And check on your brothers and serve them these cheese and bread sandwiches. He's not going as a warrior. He is a warrior, but he's not going as a warrior. And when he gets to the battle, Israel is at the top of one ridge. Philistia is at the top of another ridge. And there's a valley in the middle. That if any of them comes down into the valley, they'll get smoked by the opponent. So what Philistia has done is they've brought the challenge first. Israel should have done that first. And they sent their biggest warrior and he is an infantry soldier. In the armies of those days you had cavalry, you had infantry, and you had um, artillery. This man is not artillery. This man is not cavalry. He's infantry. He's heavy infantry. He has a shield, he has a javelin, he has a sword, he has armor. Saul is an infantry soldier, but he knows how to ride in a chariot, so he's also cavalry. David is not infantry. David is not cavalry. David is artillery. That means he's a bow and arrow man, and he's a catapult guy, a slingshot guy. Goliath comes down and he says, bring me an infantry soldier. In other words, bring somebody to me for hand-to-hand -hand combat. Let's duke it together. And if you beat me, you have us. We'll be your slaves. You plunder us. If we be you, Zion belongs to us. That's what we're aiming for. You have the best land in the world. And we want it. Hallelujah. David arrives at the battle. He sees something less rational, or rather more rational than a lion and a bear. Everybody there in Israel for 39 and a half days sees it as crisis. My wife, my children, we're all going to become their slaves. They're going to neuter my sons, emasculate my boys, and take my women. Take my mother, my, my wife, and my daughters. And everybody else's daughters. And not one of them is willing to die or to risk it. But a 16-year-old boy shows up, and where they see crisis, he sees opportunity. Where they do not see set time, David sees set time. I know he sees set time because he asks a question. He said, what is the king going to do for the man that would destroy this Goliath? And they tell him, you will get tax freedom for you and your family, the boys who don't like you. You will have lands. You will be in the king's court. He will give you one of his daughters to marry you. You're going to get a lot of money. David said, me? I can do this. I can do this. I know who's with me. I know who's around me. I know who's got my back. I know who saved me from the line. I know who will cross mountains and bulldoze them just to get me across the plains. Are you here, somebody? He said, I can do this. And his brother talked him down. If they can talk you down, you don't have a word from God. If they can talk you down, then you didn't really see this as your set time. They didn't see the opportunity. David saw the opportunity clearly. He didn't even see all its benefits. He only saw some, those which were stated in Saul's contract. What, the, what he would get from the contract with the people, he hadn't seen. Yet it was all in the contract of God. Hallelujah. So they sent him to Saul. And Saul said, you can't beat this guy. He's been an infantry warrior from his youth. And you are but a youth. He said, okay. Okay, take, you, you, you've got talk, take my armor, because he thought it was an armor battle. It had nothing to do with armor. It wasn't hand-to-hand -hand combat. In our battle, we are artillery. You can't see where we're coming from. You can't see our bullets or our missiles or our ballistics. We hit you hard because we float like butterflies. We sting like bees. Your hands can't hit what your eyes don't see. You hear what I'm saying? So, so you slap me in the face. I'm going to another level. I will not let you drag me down to the gutter where you fight because I am not only flesh and blood. I am spirit first. Hallelujah. Do you get it? A snake and an eagle. When they fight, the eagle will never fight the snake on the ground because the snake has the ground to maneuver. That's its territory. The first thing it does, it goes for the jugular and it lifts it into the sky where the snake has no maneuverability. It chokes it there and then it takes it to the nest for dinner. You understand? We are above only. So from a distance, uh, Goliath says, come, come here. Come here and I will take your head from your shoulders and I'll give you to the birds of the air. David said it's gone the other way around. David did not come into hand-to-hand -hand combat with him. 
Never fight the devil on his turf or on his terms. Don't do it. The guy who's harassing you at the job, don't do it. Deal with him at home. Come and talk to me about it. Or close the door behind you and your wife. And God who hears in secret when you pray in secret, he will deal with him for you openly. <laughs> Hallelujah. Fight your battle on your ground. On your ground. I hope somebody is listening. Can I go further? This is David's opportunity. Time has occasion for his father to authorize him to go to the battle as a servant, not a warrior. Time has opportuned him to go to the king's war tent. And the king has also authorized him. He has his parents' blessing. He has his uh, king's blessing. He has gone to the battle. He said, king, I haven't proved this your weapon. I know my own weapons. And he sees Goliath, and as an artillery officer or child, he launches his missile, a little pebble. It takes Goliath down, and Goliath falls. In the trenches, the Israelites, Joab, Abner, all the warriors, the adjutant general, the commander, all the leaders, they're in shock. David doesn't run away. He runs to Goliath. He doesn't even have a sword. You're really anointed when you can use your enemy's weapon to kill your enemy. He draws his sword out from his seat and takes his head off instantly. Israel wins the war at the hand of a little boy. The race is not to the swift. The battle is not to the strong. Neither is bread to men of understanding, nor riches to men who are learned, nor favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. It was the opportunity of every man in Israel, every warrior in the trenches, but none of them saw it, none of them seized it. Only a boy who was new to the battle saw it because he was ready. Keep doing good because your, your continuality at being good and doing good is what gets you ready for your battle. Hear me, child of God. Right after that, he takes the head and lifts it up. Shoo! The news traveled to all the women in the houses. This boy was single. Before two hours were done, all the women in town were singing, Saul has killed his thousands. Wicked people. <laughs> if they stopped there, it would have been fine. But then he continued saying, I'm with Melody. And David has killed his ten thousands. So who is the king? <laughs> Yet he would have to wait for 12 to 14 more years. How many you agree that that was a great place, a great time, but not for Eliab? Not for Saul. But for David, what was somebody else's challenge was his great place. Philistia were not thinking that what would happen to them would happen to them that day. Your great place is somebody else's tragic place. Your victory is somebody else's loss. Your win is somebody else's defeat. Don't expect them to like you. Forever, Philistia was going to come against David and his troops. But don't worry about it. God who was with you and Elah will be with you in every consequent battle with the Philistines. Don't worry about it. You hear what I'm saying? When the fish is caught in the net with about 15 of his brothers and sisters, it was a horrible time for the fish. But it was a great time for the fisherman. It was a dastardly place for the fish and a dastardly time for the fish, but it was a great place and a great time for the fisherman. He wasn't going home with empty nets that day. Always remember, on the other side of your victory is somebody else's defeat. Remember that and be kind about it. But don't be the fish that was caught in the net or the bird that was caught in the snare. Recognize your opportunity and your time and you will sense the time because the ticking of the clock will sound louder in your ears in your hearing your spiritual hearing as you get closer to it and this is my last point here are these boys Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego the king is provoked to write a decree and these, these decrees could not be reversed it was against their custom that anybody who does not bow down to this effigy of King Nebuchadnezzar, when the sound of the harp, the lute, the cymbals, the strings and all that are sounded, they will be burned in an endless fire for them. And they caught Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in this felony. They reported to the king, the king said it's not possible, let me give them another chance. 
They summoned them to come. He said, is it true that you will not bow down to worship my effigy when you hear the sound of music? He said, live long, king. They knew how to talk. Um, we wanted to be known to you that we will never bow down to your effigy. Because as it is your culture to do so, it is not our culture to bow down and serve any other God but Jehovah, the one who we cannot see with eyes, the invisible God. And we want you to know, most respectfully, O King, that our God, they didn't give him the resume of the Red Sea, but he should have known it. He is well able to deliver us from the fire. But even if he doesn't, we still will not bow. Because this God can deliver us in the fire. And not only will he deliver us from your fire, he will also deliver us from your hand. It's written in your Bible. Because the person who created the fire that you overcame, he also still has his hand to give you more trouble. So there's a boss who has set a snare for you in your office. And that snare is meant to take you out. But you overcome the snare. He still is there with his hand. So God needs to help you to deal with his hand. Or two of them. Or take him out of the place so his hand has no reach to your life. Hallelujah. Can I prophesy to somebody? There's a wicked person somewhere in your life who has blocked your every path who has turned you down, turned you off uh, who has sat on your file they've closed the door and put a padlock on it and they went to cement it in one shrine somewhere that this very capable person must not rise not in my office, this is my space hallelujah, do you understand what I'm saying but the devil is a liar God will deliver you from the snare of your supervisor and he will deliver you from the hand and the machinations of the same supervisor because God is one who holds the heart of the king in his hands and he turns it whithersoever he pleases as the rivers of water and so somebody shout great place great time but pastor how can you say this is a great place and great time when the fire we're not even in it yet but it's scorching the ears on our hands the fire is so hot that the people who lit it they're backing up because of the heat that we can feel uh, but still shout at them and tell them great place great time hallelujah to God what I'm trying to tell you is that the king threw them into the fire but it was still a great place and a great time when he threw them in he knew that they would be singed in a moment but minutes after he looks in and he's amazed and he says did we not throw in three but how come we see four and the fourth is like the son of God what is happening and they are loosed the ropes we bound them with and their clothes are not burnt but the ropes that we own have been singed completely these guys are walking around in a fire like as if they were outside of the fire you see life is strange I need seven men life is strange I need seven men to line up in this direction I'll do the ginger mid brand another time seven men I need you to line up all facing that direction behind each other seven men seven men seven men Musa is number one go forward Musa uh, and leave two steps go forward more Musa go forward more and then take two steps Felix you're good now. The rest of you take the backward steps. Toba is the last. Oh, day. That's what they call you when you're last. Fool. Musa is the first. They threw them in the fire because, as far as the Babylonians were concerned, they were the last. What they didn't know is that the king would summon to bring the three boys out. Then he would declare. That no other God, including my effigy, is to be worshipped in this Babylon. Except the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And by the way, you wicked satraps, 120 of them, you are going into the fire. Hallelujah. Number two, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego promote them to premier status in my land. They will govern all the provinces of all of Babylon. Hallelujah. Amen. Because of fire. Somebody shout, great place, great, great time. Where you are now in your life, you are in a great place. Yeah, but pastor, that's not how my life. Your life is in a great place at a great time. Because when God wants to bless you, you don't have to be in Musa's position. Musa is first right now. But what does your Bible say? It says, the first shall be last. 
and the last shall be first. Does that mean tobacco? Does that mean that God is going to take Toba by the hand and bring him and put him in front of Musa? Is that how God would do it? That's not how God works. Musa had his time. And during his time, it was exactly as it is. But when God wants to change the times and the seasons, because your chronos has become kairos, God does not move one man from the back to the front. What he does, everybody by the front about turn. And instantly, he that was last is first. He that was second to last is second. He that was third to last is third. And the one that was first has now become last. Somebody shout, it's my time. It's my time. I don't need to worry about how God is going to do it, but it's my time. I don't need to worry about what my enemies think about how far back I am and it will never happen, but it's my time. I want you to look at five people right now and tell them it's my time now. And there's nothing that the devil can do about it. It's my turn and it's my time. And the quantity that matters is not skill, it's not understanding, it's not strength, it's not power. It is favor with God. Hallelujah. Wow, wow. What a message in season. Powerful message from our pastor Paul. I did for us. I know that message is for you tonight and i know god really spoke to you and your life is moving to a next dimension and if you know that god spoke to you i need you to celebrate jesus do something for god wherever you are for the life of our pastor and his son paul adifarasi thank god hallelujah so if you need this message and you want the full message i need you to go to www h-o-t-r-m-p-3.com you will get the full message and all other messages on that platform and i believe god will bless you as you do that this evening is also time for us to give unto the lord bible says give and it shall be given to you pressed down shaking together and rolling over shall men give unto your bosom this ground is a good ground as you sow into this ground your life will not remain the same. I know that you're with your gadgets right now and the details and the information for your giving is showing on the screen right now. And please give as you are led and your life will not remain the same. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for you are the God who gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Thank you for the seed in the hands of your children. As they cast their seed, as they give on this good ground, Father, we thank you for the harvest because we know the harvest will surely come. It will come in things that money can buy. It will come in things that money cannot buy. It will also come in money. It will come in favors. It will come in open doors to the glory of your name. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have already accepted our gifts. And we give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Hallelujah to Jesus. And now I also want to invite you for our super celebration service on Sunday, 9 a.m. on this same platform. Please invite your friends, invite your family members as you tune in to our super celebration service on Sunday. It's, I, it promises to be an exciting one also. And I know that God has a word for you on Sunday. So now we also come to the end of today's service. Let's pray as we call it a day. Our Father, we thank you for you are the God who started with us. You have also finished with us. Thank you, Lord, because we know that your presence is with your children. Your presence is with them. That this evening, they will continue to hear your voice, even as you have spoken to your manservant. Thank you, Father, for as they go into their tomorrows, their lives will not remain the same. Thank you, as we come back on Sunday, you will, they will hear your voice. They will hear your voice. They will know that you are with them. You will protect and you will cover them. Thank you, King of glory. We give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. God bless you for tuning in, and may his name alone be glorified in your lives. Good evening, and have a good night rest.
Oh man, I'm always so blessed when we come into the presence of God and hear the word, whether it's the praise and worship or the word, I'm always so blessed. I'm sure you were blessed too. But something that happens to me, I don't know if it happens to you, is that sometimes once I get back into that Lagos traffic, you know, <laughs> I start to forget the things that I heard. So if you can, do yourself a favor, don't be like me, download the message at www.hotrmp3.com. That way you get to keep that presence, keep that word going on and on in your life uh, and traffic won't take it from you, work colleagues won't take it from you, hard times will take it from you because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. All right, make sure you join us again on Sunday for our super celebration service. It's going to be at the service in church live, but it's also going to be on YouTube, Facebook, and our website. We hope to see you then. Stay blessed.